Hello and welcome to The German Guy Reviews. I'm The German Guy. Not so long ago I reviewed the little adventure movie Jim Button and Lucas the Locomotive Driver. And what do you know, they made a sequel. So... Toot toot! We open up on a dark night, the ship of the pirate crew of the Wild 13 approaching the shores of Dragonland. One of the big lizards gives them the latest news about Miss Grindtooth's defeat. Also there's something going on between Mrs. Pointytail and her egg babysitter. But you didn't hear this from me. The sea bandits don't like this, as kidnapping children and selling them was their main source of income and they vow revenge. We move over to Lummerland, the island of two mountains and home of our two heroes, where it is currently raining and the narrator telling us that even bad weather isn't really bad in this paradise. Does anybody else get strong North Korea vibes with this phrasing? When the postman crashes into the island and sinks because of an especially thick fog, Jim is made once again aware that outside of Lommerland he has no extended family, unlike everyone around him, who all receive letters and packages. The next day their king makes an assembly, saying they need a lighthouse, especially since they have diplomatic relations with Mandala now, heavily increasing the ship traffic. And because everyone around here keeps making 15 separate online orders instead of making one big one. It makes the postman come a dozen times a day. Jim has a good idea. Since they lack the space for a lighthouse on the island, why don't they make the reverse optical illusion guy from the first film a citizen of their nation? Give him an oil lamp and no one will ever crash into them ever again. Yes, and they will also send their freaking armies because they think there's a human kaiju on the loose. Lucas and Jim make a few preparations, and just mere 24 hours later they are on their way. Shortly after this, a mermaid approaches them, asking for help. The engine man agrees, but makes clear that they don't have much time. 3, 2, 1, and the quest log is a phone book. Sad task revolves around a machine inside a mountain that is responsible for the light inside the ocean. The two working men reactivate it and make pretty lights on the ocean floor. But it turns out the tech works with strong magnets, sinking ships that come too close and locking their train in its place. Oh yeah, they brought their baby train with them too. I really suggest you watch the other review first. Jim and Lucas turn it off again so they can leave, but promise they will find someone who will stay on the island and guard the machine. They get the baby train, going by the name Molly. Time to find Molly! and prepare to leave, but then Jim makes a discovery. Some of the rocks are magnetic and unfold their true powers when linked by metal. So Lucas gets tinkering and, I really hope you are sitting, uses the ultimate troll physics and builds a perpetual motion machine. Forget the lighthouse boy, we are trillionaires! Yeah, this big brain time. By the way, because the magnetic stones are so strong, Molly has to be left behind. Why did you bring her in the first place? Your parenting is only surpassed by that of the Spider-Man in Across the Spider-Verse. They are back on track, although that sentence is more wrong than it has ever been before. Now that even the last few physicists have left the theater offended and demanding cancellation, we finally arrive in the desert, where they are being surprised by the Wild 13, causing Jim to panic and making their... can you call it a ship? crash in the sand. Lucas thinks that what Jim saw was just another Fata Morgana, but that would mean Jim is hallucinating pretty fast. Be that as it may, they quickly find their old friend, crying in the middle of nowhere. He can't believe at first that they are even real, but that is quickly resolved. He tells them that a terrifying dragon has invaded his home, so the two heroes go investigate. 
It's our old friend Nipomok, the dragon hippo hybrid. Really suggest you watch the first video. When Jim points out that the two have much in common since one isn't a real dragon and the other not a real giant, they quickly become friends. You are both worthless outcasts. Later that night our two train drivers explain their situation and the old man going by the name Tour Tour is overjoyed to hear that someone finally needs him. Jim then casually asks if a Forta Morgana could also show something that is true, to which Turto replies, they can reveal something about our past and maybe even our future. Today I learned that Fata Morganas are magic and I should totally listen to what it has to say. Bash in the heads of your companions and drink their liquids? You know better than I! They also have found a great new job for Nepomuk, who has been chased away by the other dragons after helping Lucas and Jim. He could be the guardian of the Magnet Island, as it is far away from Dragonland and safe. It looks like as if everything is going perfectly, but then... Racism! Between dragon and mermaid. Obviously. Yeah, such a well-known trope. Almost as much as the hatred between elves and dwarves. Each of the two beings hate the other, cause... Water and fire are no friends. Lucas points out that life isn't strictly binary. For example, their train Emma is a magnificent combination of fire and water working together to create steam. This is a weird remake of Pixar's Elementals. The guy is away from home for two days and he has fixed bigotry and given the world an infinite supply of energy. Make him fix somebody's sink and we can build our first colony on the freaking moon. As dragon and mermaid start to play in the water in harmony, the fish lady finds the crystal of eternity. See? See? But it's about time that the Wild 13 is making an impact on the story, which is what happens in form of Jim finding a letter telling them that their sweet little baby train has been kidnapped by the pirates and they want to see some coins. The two heroes want to save her but have no idea where to look. Which is why they return to the Kingdom of Mandala, where Miss Grindtooth's transformation into a golden dragon that can answer all questions has been completed. And if she is not ready, then you two could keep yourself busy by sweeping the floor. Come on, I want cyborg legs! Miss Goldtooth advises them, saying they need a ship in the ocean blue and then let it be guided by the wind, which will then carry it to the land that should not be. If they start to call him Roxas, I'm going to jump out of the window and then jump right back in and keep working on my conspiracy board. She furthermore tells them that a star will appear, which Jim needs to grab to make him invincible. In addition, when all of this is over, Jim will finally learn his true place of origin. Huh, that's a nice bonus. I think we should let people get kidnapped more often if it results in stuff like this. On the high seas, Liz a princess snuck on board despite the Kaiser's captain ordering his best man to guard the ship. Look at me, now look at your husband, back at me, look at your feet, look at this pen, look into the sky, where am I? I was never here. Out of nowhere, a ship with red sails and a big 13 appears. They try to fight them, but the armor is just too thick. They are being hijacked by the wild 13 and its 13 leads. Jim sees that the captain of the pirates has a red star on his head and figures that must be the one that the gold dragon was talking about. He tries to reach him while everyone is fighting and the air is brimming with pirate energy. That's Long John Peter to you, porthole! <laughs> Unfortunately, they are defeated and brought on board the enemy ship. The Kaiser's greatest soldiers, everyone. When the ship sails straight into a tornado, they are carried upward to their base. How do you even figure something like that out? Jim, who was hiding inside the skeleton decoration in front of the ship, wakes up after the storm and finds himself at cliffside. Close by is a cave, where the pirates are hiding out. The criminals on water are having a celebration, but that is very short-lived since they are a bunch of rowdies. A fight breaks out after one of them insults the captain. Jim uses this chance to take the star on the head. Which leads to even more infighting, as all of them shortly after proclaim themselves as the new leader. Look at me, sure. Look at me, sure. I'm the captain now. 
the young man frees the prisoners and they take a look inside the treasure chambers because he overheard the pirates talking about a basket they found him in a long time ago. And their search is being rewarded, as a letter is being found, explaining that there once was a fourth wise king who gave Jesus a gift, but his kingdom was destroyed by the dragons and so its people wander the world looking for their own land of milk and honey, called Jimbala. You would think that a great golden dragon of wisdom could have shared the story with our hero, because Jimbala is kind of on the nose. It turns out that, indeed, Jim is the son of the king and queen of that kingdom. One question remains. What to do with the nasty crew? The Mandala general suggests to just throw them into the sea. But Jim is of the opinion that all they really need is a bit of rehabilitation. Out of the blue, Lee C reveals that the golden dragon gave her yet another prophecy. There are 12 doors for each of the pirates. Yes, I myself only noticed this now. There are only 12, because they counted their captain as an extra person. Imagine you are a captain of a pirate crew and you have captured 20 tradesmen. Each bullet cost 13 silver and you have 7 gold. How much do you have left? Don't know, seems to me like a much more exciting idea to the youngins than eat your vegetables. Anyway. When the doors are opened, this land that was never meant to be will fall into the ocean and lift Jim Bala out of it. Jim gives them back their freedom, because he wants them to do the right thing by choice, not because he forces them. And in a surprising turn of events, they agree and get ready to redeem themselves. Speaking of Marv, these are 12 bloodthirsty pirates and if just one of them had said no, you could have kissed your dreams of your own homeland goodbye forever. That's what I call high-risk, high-reward gambling. Anyway, the cave is flooded and with it the entire floating rock sinks. After they fish the pirates out of the sea, they go back home and say hi to all of their friends. Almost home, they realize Lummerland became much, much bigger than what it was before. Which is exactly what the dragon was talking about. Like the weight on a scale, the big rock pushed the lost kingdom up to the surface again. Great job! Now millions of black immigrants will settle in Lumberland, causing a far-right uprising that the world hasn't seen since the 1930s. The pirates get an education, Lizzie and her father are back together, Toto is getting to work and everyone lives happily ever after. And that was Jim Button and the Wild Thirteen. And it's... kind of boring. You would think that a movie with dastardly pirates would be even more adventurous than the first. But no, we spent the first half of the film running errands and the other is spent mostly talking about prophecies. Only the last half hour is kind of exciting, but not really, at least not for a finale. In the first film, the stakes were much higher. They were running from one life-threatening event into the next. Here it feels as if you are in a plane that's barely above the ground and never truly taking off. They got a freaking flying train and they're not really doing anything with it. The other problem is that it's mostly visiting already familiar faces and places. And the new ones weren't all that interesting. The island was lifeless rocks and the pirate cave was a cave. They were teasing an underwater kingdom, but we never got to see it. It feels as if these movies are in the wrong order. As in, the first movie is the sequel that does everything the first one does, but way, way better. For example, the puzzles and riddles are not really challenges. What I mean is, what if Miss Grindtooth had made a prophecy in form of a riddle that made giving the pirates another chance, being the bigger man, part of their quest? Lizzie just straight up gives them the dragon's instructions. There's no wittiness, no cleverness required. Not like the first film where Jim proved over and over again his strength of will and intelligence. It feels at times as if Jim is like us the viewer, not really a participant in this story. The world is still very whimsical and all that, but that alone is simply not enough. Not if you want to make an adventure film. By the end of this tale, Jim still hasn't found his real parents, so it is possible that they are going to make this a trilogy. We will see. For now, I'm the German guy, and I'm out. Auf Wiedersehen.
Yeah. This is big brain time.